Thank you for coming to the panel this evening um, on heritage issues in the Middle East. Um, I'd like to start by thanking um, the people who put this together, um, Beth Wolfeson and Navy, Amy Noblet of the um, Boston University Art Law Society. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Lawyers Committee for Cultural Heritage Preservation, um, and then the BU sponsors, the Archaeological Institute of America, the American Schools of Oriental Research, um, the, Birthright, the Birthright Israel of Boston University, the Institute for the Study of the, Inst the Institute for the Study of Muslim Societies and Civilizations, the Center for Archaeological Studies in the Archaeology Department, uh, the Jewish Law Students Association, um, and of course our host tonight, the Hillel House. Um, the panel will focus tonight on heritage issues, um, and specifically with regard to the Middle East. Um, the format will be for me to tell you a little bit about myself, um, and then for each panelist to come up um, and speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, um, and then we'll hold discussion until after the panelists have finished. Um, and we look forward to discussion after that, and then there'll be a reception that will follow. My own interest in the region um, began in 2001 uh, when I went to work on an archaeological survey project in western Turkey. Um, and I went kind of to help um, the director, Chris Roosevelt, who is now at Boston University, and he and I co-direct a survey project there. We were interested in the archaeological heritage and not so interested in plunder. Um, and we were very surprised to find how much plunder was occurring in the area. Um, and so that's how kind of I got catapulted into these issues and very interested in what was causing the plunder, was it the demand, um, if so, where was the demand coming from, was it inside Turkey, was it outside in the United States, was it in the United Kingdom, um, in Europe, et cetera. Um, and after that, I went to work for the U.S. Department of State um, as a cultural property researcher um, in the office that implements the 1970 UNESCO Convention. And from that work, um, I began to get really interested in a variety of, a variety of issues, including kind of the overarching legal instruments um, and whether they're effective um, and what their limits are, and also what are the possibilities um, with regard to policy. Um, after that, I left state um, in 2003, and I came to BU, and since then have been doing archaeological research, um, both in a little bit in Latin America um, and more so in Turkey, where I'm working on documenting looting as well as a number of other issues that pertain to the market. Um, there are a number of students here at BU involved in large-scale heritage management programs, um, both in Turkey as well as elsewhere, um, and we have a new program um, going on with the Museum of Fine Arts um, and looking at auction catalogs and kind of the history of um, material from Western Turkey. So that's my own kind of personal interest in this sort of um, material. And I'm also involved with um, the Journal of Field Archaeology here, where I co-edit the Archaeological Heritage and Ethics session with a, another panelist tonight, Morag Kersel. Um, and that comes out um, four times a year, and there's usually an article in it. And the person who does the annual summaries is Patty Gerstenblith, um, who's here as well. Um, the panelists tonight will focus on the Middle East um, and kind of the issues that pertain to heritage in general. And we put together uh, this group largely because they represent a lot of different aspects. Um, we have uh, Patty Gersten Blith, who is very, very active in cultural heritage preservation from the legal side of things and from policy. Um, we have Morag Kersel, who's done extensive work in the Middle East looking at ethnography. Um, she is interested in all of the various stakeholders, um, including the looters, the collectors, the dealers. Um, and she's also interested in collecting and dealing not just in the Middle East, but also in New York, um, in London, et cetera. And she's the only person I know of who's really interviewing everybody um, and not trying to take just one side. Um, we also have Jane Levine, um, who is at Sotheby's, and she will provide kind of a snapshot of the auction house um, and the due diligence that they are starting to Im implement very, very um, strongly. And I'll tell you more about each of the panelists as we go along. This is just a little bit. Um, I've also done a lot of work with various professional groups in the U.S. and abroad, putting together workshops um, focused on how we can get around um, just looking at this from a one-sided debate. There's a lot of talk about archaeological context and that context is destroyed um, when something is plundered. Um, I like to think of this debate beyond the object. Um, we need to think more along the lines of broad-based heritage management planning 
um, looking at not only protection of the object itself, who should own it, if it should be owned, where it should be stored, and the best location for it, but also large-scale preservation issues um, in the world, and looking at how archaeological sites are protected, as well as the social context in which those archaeological sites reside, so the larger um, natural environment, as well as the interest of the local communities. Um, and then on the other side here, we need to think more about how we interact with the various communities interested in these debates in the United States. So the archaeological community and the collecting community tend to be kind of the, the two sides of issues, but how we get those two groups um, to talk and communicate um, is, I think, one of the forefront issues that we all need to come together um, and figure out how uh, this debate can move in a more progressive fashion um, and we can start doing some broad scale regional planning um, and international development. So with that, I will um, turn the floor over to Patty Gerstenbluth um, and I'll tell you just a little bit more about her. Um, at, she is um, the director of DePaul College of Law um, program there um, with an emphasis on cultural heritage law. She's also the founding president of the Lawyers um, Committee for Cultural Heritage Preservation. You have flyers um, in your chairs um, that will tell you more about the Lawyers Committee. Um, she is the senior advisor to the International Arts and Cultural Property Committee of the ABA Section on International Law. She also served um, many years as the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Cultural Property. She's a former member of the United States Cultural Property Advisory Committee, um, the committee responsible for implementing the 1970 UNESCO Convention in the United States. Um, and she works with a number of professional organizations, including the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, so it was probably more than she wanted, um, but I will turn the floor over to her now um, and let her speak. I think if you just press. I guess I need to stand up here for you to hear me. So thank you, Christina, and thank you to Beth uh, Wolfson and to Amy Noblet for inviting me to speak tonight and also for putting together this program. And uh, thank you to the other sponsors and the Hillel House as well for providing the venue. Um, I'm gonna try in a relatively short amount of time that's been given to us to speak to try to bring together what has developed as two separate areas of the law, particularly international law. One is the law of warfare, uh, dealing with protection of cultural heritage during armed conflict and the other is the threat to cultural heritage through looting and trafficking in cultural objects. These two areas of the law have developed over the centuries as fairly distinct bodies of law, and yet the argument can be made that they really should be viewed as more united with each other than they traditionally are. And after explaining these two parts of the equation, I'm gonna to try to show how the aftermath of the 2003 Gulf War brings together these two disparate strands. So throughout most of history, the major threat to cultural heritage came from warfare. Uh, the, when one country or one group conquered another, they would typically uh, loot the cultural objects, often destroy them, sometimes use them to provide monetary gain. And all of this is exemplified by the view that you have of the Arch of Titus in Rome showing the booty being carried off from the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. In particular, I'm sorry, I don't have a, um, a laser pointer here, but you can see the, uh, the menorah from the Second Temple that was carried in the triumphal procession uh, celebrating the victory over Jerusalem by the Roman conquerors. And so this shows not only how uh, they would remove the cultural symbols and religious symbols that were important to a conquered people, but also to parade them to, as a way of showing how the victor has vanquished the conquered. Now, that remained uh, for many centuries uh, the basic motivation of the effects of, of armed conflict on cultural property. During the 19th century, following the Napoleonic Wars, and particularly during the Civil War here in the United States, uh, there began to be developed a, the concept of a law of warfare, that while war was being carried out, it nonetheless should be done so with limits uh, for humanitarian purposes. And I know that may sound a little bit contradictory, but um, many different aspects of international humanitarian law developed in the later part of the 19th century. Uh, 
That led to the first two Hague Conventions, the 1899 and 1907 Hague Conventions on the Conduct of Warfare, which included within them some provisions for protection of cultural property. But following the widespread destruction, looting, uh, damage to cultural heritage in World War II, the 1954 Hague Convention was finally adopted by the international community. Its two major provisions were to safeguard and to show respect for cultural property. And I'm gonna just run through some of the provisions. There's a lot, gonna be a lot more text on the screens than, than um, either you or I can read in the time. But basically, first of all, nations that were parties to the Hague Convention needed to, needed to prepare to protect their own cultural property during peacetime in case of uh, war or armed conflict. And they were also supposed to, during warfare, to show respect for cultural property by not targeting uh, or making a specific target out of cultural property during conflict. Now, unfortunately, that last part, uh, that last provision is subject to what's called the military necessity waiver. So if a country that was attacking another one um, felt that it was necessary for military purposes to in fact target or attack cultural property, then they could go ahead and do so. Uh, without violating the convention. So that was a pretty big loophole that was originally written into the convention provisions. The third major provision is that uh, parties to the convention were to prevent and prohibit any form of theft, pillage, or misappropriation or vandalism directed against cultural property. And until 2003, virtually nobody paid any attention to this provision, uh, but since that time it has uh, provoked some uh, interesting discussion. Hague Convention also provides during times of occupation, the occupying power is supposed to not interfere unduly with the cultural heritage of occupied territory. It is instead supposed to work with the competent national authorities and only preserve cultural property when there are no local authorities to do so. Two other provisions deal with how to um, ensure that your military is prepared to protect cultural property during armed conflict. One is to have within your military rules and regulations to ensure protection of cultural heritage uh, as provided by the Hague Convention. And secondly, to have within your armed forces in some form specialists who can help to carry out the provisions of the convention as well. Another provision of the Hague Convention is that allows for what's called the Blue Shield. And we in the United States have a lot of trouble with this because most of us, when we think of Blue Shield, we think of Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's not what this is. Uh, this is the symbol that is used to mark cultural heritage. It is uh, not mandatory, it's voluntary, but it can be done so that other uh, parties to a conflict will know what is protected cultural property. Now, separate from the main convention, but adopted at the same time in 1954, was the first protocol which deals with movable cultural objects. Basically, it says that an occupying power should prevent the export of cultural property from occupied territory. If cultural property removed in violation of that appears in your territory, you're supposed to return it. At the end, you're supposed to seize it and then return it at the end of the hostilities and the occupation. Now, in 1999, the second protocol was written largely to respond to problems that had been perceived in the main convention, particularly during the wars in the Balkans in the 1990s. Among other things, the second protocol narrows the military necessity waiver, in other words, the circumstances that would qualify as military necessity uh, is reduced. It requires nations to create a criminal offense for serious violations of the convention, including High, uh, you know, the higher command, now there's not sorry the person who carries out the violation, but the person in command uh, could also be liable for criminal um, liability. Uh, it also requires that if you are going, even if you're justified in attacking a cultural site or perhaps causing collateral damage, it has to be proportionate to the military advantage which you expect to gain from that. Now, the second protocol only came into effect in 2004. None of the countries that were party to the conflict in Iraq um, were or are yet parties to it. So I'm really not going to talk about the second protocol um, anymore uh, in my discussion. Now, following World War II, a second factor entered 
to uh, pose a threat to cultural heritage, and that was the market in antiquities. The uh, antiquities cannot be manufactured unless they're fakes. Therefore, in order to satisfy the increasing demand and interest in acquiring artifacts, the way to get them was, in fact, to loot archaeological sites. Now, the looting of archaeological sites have, um, I'm going to summarize, as three sort of detrimental effects. Um, and this is just a very brief summary. But the first is uh, the destruction of archaeological context. And I don't know how many of you here are archaeologists and how many are lawyers. To the archaeologists, what I'm saying is probably pretty self-evident. Um, but to non-archaeologists, it may not be quite so self-evident. Um, in the Middle East was developed really, um, you know, although this, what we call the science of archaeology started developing by the early 19th century and perhaps even earlier, several of the archaeologists who worked in the Middle East uh, were really the pioneers of developing the scientific method for excavation of archaeological sites based on the science of stratigraphy. The typical archaeological site in the Middle East is made up of an accumulation of mud brick uh, layers or strata, which leads to what's called stratigraphy, and essential, sort of like a layer cake in reverse chronological order. Ideally, when excavating a site, as you see here in a very sort of simplistic diagram, nonetheless, you want to excavate and recover each layer separately from the others so that you get a complete association or context of objects, architectural features, and other kinds of remains, faunal and floral remains. And it's only through the proper excavation of a site that the full history can be reconstructed and we can get um, as close as possible to complete understanding of ancient life. Now this is a sketch that was done of a cross-section of an archaeological site by Sir Flinders Petrie who worked at the turn of the last century, um, roughly the early 1900s, both in Egypt and in the Negev Desert. This is a site called Tel Hesse. Uh, from the Negev Desert. It shows the beginnings of the idea of how stratigraphy can be recorded and used. Uh, you can see the, the cross-section through the architectural features there and a fairly schematic representation of the different levels and floors that you would have going with it. Um, the other major pioneer who worked in the Middle East, of course, was Dame Kathleen Kenyon, who worked at Jerusalem and Jericho. And we see here um, a snippet on your right of one of her notebooks from her excavations at Jerusalem. Again, you can see the concept of stratigraphy being shown in her drawing. That's from the middle of the 20th century. Now, since that time, many more sophisticated scientific techniques have been developed. I'm not going to go into those right now. But obviously, the more uh, information that can be recovered, the better it is for our understanding of the past. So if a site is looted, we lose that information. We may have the object, but we don't have its context. Now, the second detriment is that objects themselves are destroyed or damaged. And I'll just use one example to illustrate that. In the image on your left is a relief from a site in northern Iraq from the Neo-Assyrian period, roughly 8th century BCE, the site of um, Nineveh. And this was documented by Professor John Russell in the late 1980s. And um, if you take a look at this gentleman over here, the one with the large earring, you will see that it reappears in the image on your right uh, that Professor Russell was shown in the mid-1990s as a photograph. It's a piece, it was chiseled out of the relief, the stone relief that was originally in the site as of the late 1980s, and recut to make it more saleable, to make it more easier to transport onto the market. But Professor Russell was able to identify this as a piece that had been taken, uh, that had been in situ just a few years, old, few years before, a piece that was then being offered for sale on the market. So I think this shows the example of some of the damage that is done through, uh, through the market. The third effect of undocumented antiquities is the possibility of fakes and forgeries entering into the historical record. And I'll just refer here briefly to some examples uh, from Israel. This is the uh, fairly well-known James Ossuary, or so-called uh, James Ossuary, with an inscription on it, uh, read to, to say, James, uh, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And of course, if the inscription is authentic, this would be a very important piece of evidence of the formation of the early Christian church in Jerusalem. 
However, many scholars believe that this is an inscription that was added later. The box itself may be authentic, but the inscription may have been added later. Nobody knows for sure. There is no agreement on it. But there were also several other inscriptions that have appeared. In the one on your left is what's called the Jehoash tablet, which may have related to the first temple period, which I think is fairly widely accepted to be a fake. And on your right is a um, pomegranate, a vessel in the shape of a pomegranate, which was purchased by the Israel Museum several years ago, also with an inscription now thought to possibly also be fake. So the problem is with undocumented objects, objects that we don't know where they came from, we can never be sure what is authentic and what is not authentic, uh, leading to the possibilities of corruption of the historical record. Now, the response to the trafficking in archaeological and other kinds of cultural objects led to the adoption of the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which has a very long name. Um, I won't uh, go into that. Um, several market nations have now ratified this convention, uh, but the United States was one of the first to do so. We, did, uh, we implemented it through the Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act, which prohibits the import into the United States of cultural objects stolen from museums, and also allows other countries to enter into supplementary agreements with the United States uh, to prohibit the import of undocumented archaeological and ethnological materials into the United States. Uh, this is a chart from the State Department website that shows um, it's not up to date. It's actually almost a year out of date at the moment because it doesn't show the most recent agreement with China that was uh, entered into in January. But it gives you a good idea of the countries. Now, this is only about 10% of the countries that could theoretically ask for agreements with the United States. Um, but it shows the dates and some of the types of material which is subject to import restriction under our implementation of the UNESCO Convention. The other legal response to the problem of illegal trafficking is through uh, recognition of foreign countries' national ownership laws. <coughs> countries that are rich in archaeological heritage have often enacted what are called national vesting laws. In other words, objects, artifacts that are in the ground are vested, ownership of them is vested in the nation. And when objects are removed, they're considered to be stolen property. Although this doctrine in the United States goes back to the 1970s, uh, it was affirmed in a 2003 case involving a dealer called Frederick Schultz, who was convicted of conspiring to deal in antiquities looted from Egypt, including this Amenhot head of uh, the pharaoh, Amenhotep III, um, that you see on your left, although these are actually both the same piece of sculpture. But there's a story behind that that I won't go into right now. <laughs> Um, but this doctrine was recently also adopted by the British courts in a case involving antiquities looted from Iran. So it is not just the United States that has um, adopted the doctrine of recognizing foreign national ownership laws as a way of combating the trade in stolen antiquities. Now this brings me to the war in Iraq in 2003 and its aftermath continuing up to today. First of all, we see destruction of cultural objects. In this case, it was destruction carried out not by American forces, but by local Iraqis, uh, who essentially were given the opportunity, or the opportunity was created through the chaos, through the lack of internal control, legal control, and order. Um, caused through at the time of the invasion of Iraq. Now this is a view of, I think it's the National Library, but it might be the National Archives, so I apologize. I can't remember exactly which one it is. But it shows how the documents that were housed in the institution were piled up and set on fire. So there was very widespread looting of cultural sites. Most of you have heard about the looting of the museum. I'll refer to that again in a moment. Um, but other cultural sites, other museums were looted as well, looted and in some cases, destroyed. Another effect was the United States um, but put military bases on several of the most important archaeological sites in Iraq, including uh, this one at Babylon. And what you see here is a helicopter landing pad that was constructed right on the archaeological site. And the, uh, the base, the construction of the base, caused damage to the site itself which has been documented since that time in reports. But just one example is caused by the uh, leveling of part of the site to create the helicopter landing pad and, of course, the effect of the vibrations of having 
uh, the helicopters land and take off from there. Another type of damage that was done to cultural sites um, was in the town of Samara, which uh, this is a, an image of the Al Mutawakil Mosque from the 9th century CE. A uh, very important time in the history, the Islamic history of Iraq. And this minaret for the mosque was so symbolic of Iraqi history that it is the symbol that is used on Iraqi currency. This had been used as a sniper's nest by the insurgents. And the United States military got the insurgents uh, out of the, um, obviously this provided a great vantage point, but then decided to use it itself use the top of the minaret itself for, as its own, basically, sniper's nest or vantage point. As a result, the top of the minaret was um, bombed by insurgents, and you see the image on your uh, right that shows um, some of the damage that was done. Fortunately, the damage was done was to a re mostly to a reconstructed section, but nonetheless, it was an unnecessary exposure of a cultural site to damage um, and pretty clearly a violation of at least the principles of the Hague Convention. Now on the trafficking side, you are, as, as I said, probably familiar with the looting of the Iraq Museum in April of 2003. This is um, just one view of the inside of the museum uh, where the, this is the base for the work of A's, which was um, taken, although re then returned. The, one of the most important pieces, about 15,000 pieces probably were looted from the museum. One of the most important that has been recovered from outside of Iraq was the late third millennium BCE statue of a king uh, named Entemena, or Enmatana, depending on how you call it. And that was picked up by US Customs agents, uh, ICE, and uh, returned to the Iraqis, although I believe it is still resident in Washington, DC at the moment. Far more extensive and probably far more significant than the looting of the museum is the looting of the sites in southern Iraq. You can see on the bottom the fairly even rectangular shapes uh, that were part of the excavations carried out by Iraqi archaeologists. But then going off into the distance are pits, looters' pits and holes caused by looters just searching for artifacts. Another site in southern Iraq, these are all looters' holes, and a close-up view of the looters waving to the American military helicopter overhead. Um, there are different interpretations. Some of us think they're trying to call the helicopter down so they can sell some artifacts, but, and there are some less complementary interpretations as well. Now, most recently, uh, this past December, uh, during the um, antiquities sales, uh, Christie's offered in its catalog uh, these two earrings, which it identified as a pair of Neo-Assyrian gold earrings from the 8th to 7th centuries BCE. Um, the earrings that it offered bear an uncanny resemblance, as you'll see. There we go. On your left are, again, the Christie's earrings. On your right are earrings that were found uh, in the royal tombs excavated in the late 1980s at a site called Nimrud in the north of Iraq. Uh, they are very similar. Uh, this is an ongoing investigation. Nobody yet knows for sure where, what the background of the earrings were that Christie's was offering for sale. It withdrew them from sale, and it's an ongoing investigation now. But this may be an example of um, artifacts from Iraq appearing on the market. Um, but I don't want to say too much because at this point it would simply be speculation. Now, legally there have been some interesting responses. Um, the response to the looting of the Iraq Museum was far more significant than I ever would have believed and I think many others would probably agree with me. The UN Security Council passed a resolution 1483 calling on all member nations, all nations that are members of the United Nations, to basically impose import restrictions to prevent trading in artifacts that were looted either from institutions or from archaeological sites in Iraq. Um, going back to 1990, the time of the original sanctions that were imposed against um, Iraq at the time of the invasion of Kuwait. Quickly after the passage of the UN Security Council resolution, the United Kingdom, 
Switzerland, the European Union, also Russia, which I don't have up here, and the United States all enacted domestic implementing legislation to put the UN Security Council resolution into effect. The US did so as a method of uh, basically amending the Cultural Property Implementation Act through passage of specific legislation. I know that Dr. Uh, Magnus Gardner is going to be talking a little bit more about this, so I won't go into it in any more detail at the moment. Finally, there have been, um, maybe I shouldn't say quite finally, but there have been developments with respect to the Hague Convention itself. I should say, ironically, that the attention paid to the looting of sites and looting of the museum in Iraq led to more nations implementing the 1970 UNESCO Convention. Um, I can't explain that logically, but nonetheless it happened. But in addition to that, the United Kingdom, uh, which like the US, had signed the Hague Convention in 1954 but never ratified it. So without ratification, it was not legally binding on the, our two countries, except to the extent that we viewed the underlying principles as a part of what's called international customary, customary international law. Now in January 2008, the UK introduced draft legislation to implement ratification of the convention and both protocols. Among other things, this legislation would establish criminal offense for violations uh, pursuant to the second protocol and also criminal offense for dealing in cultural objects illegally removed from occupied territory under the first protocol. Now that legislation has run into a snag in Parliament, but there is still hope that it may be adopted within the next year or two. Germany became the first country to enact implementing legislation for the first protocol. And retroactive sort of in quotes, it had actually ratified the first protocol in 1967. So its legislation was, uh, applies to anything illegally removed after 1967. And perhaps the most um, happiest of consequences is that just a little over two weeks ago, March 13th of this year, the US deposited its instrument of ratification and immediately became a member of the Hague Convention because we are engaged at this time in armed conflict. So I guess I would conclude by saying that out of a lot of damage and out of a lot of um, inflicted uh, dis destruction is a bit of a strong word, but nonetheless, um, damage and destruction to cultural heritage in Iraq has in fact come some positive consequences. And we'll only have to see how this continues to develop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, can you all hear me? I feel like I'm talking into nowhere. All right, um, our next speaker is Morag Kersel. She's a research associate um, at the Oriel Institute at the University of Chicago. Um, and as I mentioned before, she is involved with um, doing interviews and ethnographies of a variety of stakeholders, um, including uh, a variety of people in um, Israel, pa the Palestinian Authority, Greece and Jordan, uh, looking at looting, looking at collecting, um, and looking at the international trade. Um, she is an archaeologist as well. Um, she's done field work extensively throughout the Middle East, um, in, including Greece, um, Israel, Jordan, um, Egypt, and I also believe she's worked in Africa and in Puerto Rico. Um, she is the former program coordinator of the uh, Bas Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Heritage Preservation at the Department of State as well. So she has a, a broad background in these issues. And I will turn the floor over to her. Thanks. Um, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to also include my thanks for the BU Art Law Society for inviting me to speak today. It's always a great pleasure to have a captive audience to talk about your research. Um, I want to start by saying my name is Maria Kersel, and I'm an archaeologist. And I feel like I'm on a 12-step program. But just so that you all know, and, and in the interest of full disclosure, I am a dirt archaeologist. That's how I got my start, and that's um, where I find my roots. Um, both metaphorically and um, academically. Um, but while I'm a dirt archaeologist, I'm very interested in the intersection between archaeology and law, and how law works to help us archaeologists or hinder us, and whether or not it works to protect archaeological sites. So specifically, more specifically, I'm examining the legal remedies employed in countries in the Eastern Mediterranean to protect against 
archaeological site destruction or looting as a result of the market demand for archaeological artifacts. So as Christina mentioned, I do a series of interviews. And today I'm going to talk to you about how I gather my data because we have, I'm not a lawyer, but I look at law and I want to look at the effects of law, but I'm going to tell you how I collect the data that helps inform us about law. So I do a series of interviews with the various stakeholders, and as Christina mentioned, that's people like collectors, dealers, looters, government employees, archaeologists, people who have any kind of vested interest in the trade in antiquities. Um, and I combine my research from Israel, where there's currently a legal trade in antiquities. You can purchase artifacts from um, pre-1978 uh, collections when they established their national ownership law. From the PA, where, and that's Palestine, where they are contemplating the trade in antiquities in their draft legislation. I looked at Jordan, where they banned the trade in 1976, so I looked at the law and whether that had any effects on archaeological looting. And I also looked at Greece where they have a legal internal trade. So if you're Greek, you can own pieces, but you can't export them outside of the country. So I tried to look at all of those various legal, uh, legal regimes to see whether any of them are effective in protecting the archaeological landscape. I have a lot of um, what I consider, as an archaeologist, very disturbing photos this evening of looting. Um, Patty already showed you some, but I'm going to show you some more from my areas of research. This is looting, was taken in December at Babadra in Jordan. And I don't know if anyone's been there, but that's on the Dead Sea, um, along the Dead Sea coast, and it's an early Bronze Age cemetery. So um, what I'm interested in most, most of all is whether the demand for archaeological material in the marketplace, whether that means there will be looting in a country or at particular sites. And as I said, do any of the various legal regimes have any effect? What I'm, oh, sorry. What I'm most interested in is looking at how pots go from the ground to the consumer. And those two slides, the first one was from Baba Dra, close up of one of the pots looted from the EB cemetery. And this is a shop window in Israel where the pots are for sale. So I'm trying to track how the pots are getting from Jordan to Israel, or from Palestine to Israel, or from wherever. I'm trying to look at how artifacts go from the ground to the consumer. You may wonder, it doesn't look like there's anything here, archaeologically or not. This is a looted site in the eastern desert of Jordan. And we are not that far from the Saudi border, and the Iraq border's up that way. And there's really nothing in this area, but there is looting. So my research questions, basically, to frame the research are, is there a connection between supply and demand in the antiquities trade? What is the impact of the legally sanctioned trade? And more specifically for my PhD research, that's what I looked at in Israel, whether that, tr that trade, the legally sanctioned trade, had any effects on looting where the material was coming from, is the Israeli market a good model, and how effective the laws are. But how did I go about doing this? Well, as a naive PhD student, even though I'm not that young, I was very naive in taking on this project. I realized early on that this is actually more social anthropology than archaeology. So it's kind of social archaeology. That's what um, I like to to call it. So I consulted with a lot of social anthropologists, policy makers, and lawyers, and various other people, educators, who helped me sort of design a research methodology in order to make sure that my research was credible and that the data that I was going to provide we could actually use to counter attacks that, in fact, there is no connection between supply and demand, and there's no, you know, just because somebody wants to buy a pot, it doesn't mean that a site's going to get looted. So I collected the data, as I said, and I spent 14 months living in the Middle East. I, um, for my PhD, I spent 14 months there, and then I've just, two years ago, spent six months living in Jordan, and then most recently, I've spent almost six months in total living in Greece, talking to the various uh, stakeholders. So as you can imagine, because this is the uh, Middle East or the Eastern Mediterranean, I drank lots of coffee and tea. 
And I put together a interview guide that had a series of questions that I would ask people about the trade in antiquities. But what I found early on was that it was very ineffective to go to people and say, OK, question one, do you think this? Question two, do you think this? This was not the way to go about doing this. So I spent months cultivating relationships with people, which meant drinking a lot of coffee and tea, eating a lot of food that I was not normally used to. And when I went out to, to um, start my research, I was a vegetarian. But by the end, I wasn't. Uh, because it's very difficult to say no when someone offers you, in a very splendid feast, uh, some lamb or some sheep or whatever. And so um, I'm not a vegetarian anymore. Um, but, and, and I also didn't really like coffee going into this either. So, but I drink coffee now. And so over more coffee, I um, gathered a lot of information. And the way you know, I took, I did not record anyone, because people found it very intimidating. And you know, also, I was asking people sometimes some very sensitive questions that may be incriminating later in life, either through the loss of face, or they're telling me that they do illegal things, and it's surprising how many people told me that they sold illegal material. It's um, actually quite shocking. So I used um, no one's name. I often asked, didn't ask people's names because I preferred not to know, and I gave the guarantee of anonymity. I took notes, and then I would go back to my, um, I kindly had a fellowship at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem. I would go back to my room at the Albright, type up the notes, and then I would send a transcript of the meeting with the individual I interviewed and ask them to either, you know, to look at the transcript and they could X out or add things or do whatever they wanted to the transcript and then sign off on it. And my research was all covered under my university's um, review board, so it was all ethical and I had to submit a copy of my interview guide so that um, people could see the kinds of questions I was asking. In only one instance did someone withdraw from the um, interview process after reading their words in print. And in fact, what I found was that more people would add information. When they got the copy of the transcript, they would often say, oh, I forgot to tell you about this time when I sold this illegal pot that came to me from some Bedouin guy who came in on a Saturday who had gotten it from his brother in um, Palestine. So um, I got a lot of extra information, and it turned out to be a very effective methodology. Like all good archaeologists, uh, I use the triangulation method, where in archaeology, if you have three stones, it's a wall. If three people said the same thing independently, then it was a fact. So if three people told me that the Bedouin were moving material from you know, the east to the west, or the west to the east, then I um, formulated, you know, I tried to follow up on that, and I used that as the basis for my um, research. So what were my results? So I just want to, sorry, go back to this. Um, this is one of the sites that I work, that I work at in Greece, and I have a couple of students here today, and I'm sure they recognize this. Um, and this is looting from the 50s and 60s, and I'm going to come back to this, and that's why I wanted to point it out. So what were my results? Well, I was able to coordinate this nifty uh, pyramid of looting. Uh, this is one of my original results, where I, in Israel and Palestine, could actually trace the pathway of a coin from its original looted um, spot to a New York um, tourist who purchased it for, to take home. So I was able to figure out all the different people and the machinations and the kinds of um, pathways that artifacts travel and the direction of movement and there are lots and lots of looters at the bottom. And then it, as you go up in the pyramid, there are fewer and fewer people involved in the trade. And at the very end, you have the high-end collectors, which are very few. And you know, by collectors, I'm including um, educational institutions, museums, and tourists. Uh, it's not just about individuals. So in Jordan, where they banned the trade in 1976, in order to combat looting, this is what the impetus for banning, you know, for passing that legislation was, there is looting. 
I spent, as I said, spent six months there, and at almost every site I visited and almost every archaeologist I spoke to, they have encountered looting at some point in their careers. In Israel, where I spent 14 months researching, there is looting. They have legal trade, and there I spoke to, I can't tell you how many people who told me they were selling illegally excavated material, maybe excavated last month, in their shops um, using an exchange of registry system where they exchange numbers for old material, and they are selling illegally excavated material as legal. In the PA, there is looting. Unfortunately, because the market in Israel is um, hot and there are lots of people purchasing things, a lot of uh, artif uh, artifacts and sites are being looted in the PA. And in Greece, there is looting. Even though they have banned the export of illegally excavated material, it's, Ill it's legal for Greeks to purchase it and own it, but there is still looting there. I wanted to, I'm just about finished, but I just wanted to stop with, um, to show you, I work, um, most recently I run field schools at this pristine site, which I can tell you is a very fun summer thing to do. Um, this is the site of Keros in the Cyclades. So you, we spend six weeks uh, every year there excavating at an early Bronze Age site where we find cycladic figurines. I'm sure many of you have seen them in their entirety. But in the uh, early 1990s, uh, Chris Chippendale and David Gill wrote an article about the esteem for cycladic figurines in which they stated that over 90% of the figurines that we know of are from the market and we don't know where in the world they come from. I mean, we can guess that they come from Greece, but we don't know if they're from a burial context, if they're from a domestic context, if they're from a cultic context, because they've been purchased on the market. In the past three years, we have found over 500 fragments of cycladic figurines, which will change the way we think about the cycladic culture. Because we have found them in this area, not in a burial context, not in a domestic context, but just at the side of the road, basically. So we are now reinterpreting these, and we would not know, I mean, we, we know more about these figurines in the last three years than we have known in the last um, 40 years, because this site has been looted in the 50s and 60s, as I pointed out earlier. So I want to just end by saying, uh, I want to state categorically, I'm not against collecting. Um, I'm against the collecting of unprevenient material. But I can say that in my research, I have been able to show that there is a connection between the demand for archaeological artifacts and the looting of sites. This is a cycladic figurine that, in the December sale at Sotheby's, sold for over a million dollars. Now, my colleague Jane is going to, uh, Jane Levine is going to explain to you, I mean, um, some of the intricacies of the auction world, but what's interesting about this piece is the value of it was probably, and Jane will correct me if I'm wrong, enhanced by the fact that it had a very pristine provenance. So we know exactly where it came from and its object history. And it has been uh, in, it was in a private collection for a number of years and it is a legally available item that was um, sold on the market for a lot of money. But as I just explained, there are a lot of uh, artifacts and there's a lot of material out there that's in the market that isn't legal and that illegally makes its way into the market. So my search and my research continues and I'm hoping to broaden my um, research into Cyprus and Egypt in order to sort of broaden my Eastern Mediterranean focus because they also have some interesting laws and they've been very proactive in um, combating the trade against uh, looted antiquities. So I'm hoping to continue that. But that's just a snippet of what a dirt archaeologist who's interested in the effects of the um, demand for archaeological artifacts has on um, the archaeological site and how law interacts with our um, daily activities. And I know many of you who are archaeologists in the room probably don't think about law, but you should. So. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, thank you, Morag. Um, I hope I, I found her presentation really interesting and the type of work that she's doing uh, and really looking at all of these issues um, from a very even keeled perspective. Um, our next speaker um, is Jane Levine. Uh, she is the Senior Vice President and Worldwide Director of Compliance for Sotheby's, um, where she's responsible for the auction process, for the due diligence, um, and for making sure that things are as above board as they possibly can be. Prior to joining Sotheby's, um, she was the Assistant U United States Attorney for the Southern, Southern District of New York, and there she was um, the Art Fraud Coordinator, um, and she oversaw the, art cr uh, the FBI Art Theft Crime Team um, and prosecuted a lot of cases um, dealing with cultural property. So she's kind of, she's, I think it's fair to say, flipped flipped at least where she um, has been located, but her um, interest and um, dedication to the issues um, has remained the same um, and her experience as an AUSA in the Southern District I no doubt um, influences um, the expertise she brings to Sotheby's. Thank you. S some would say, Christine, I've gone over to the dark side, but <laughs> flipping is probably a good word too. Um, uh, I also want to uh, start by thanking the BU Art Law Society and all the other sponsoring organizations for inviting me here to speak on this panel. Um, a vestige from my former position as a uh, former federal prosecutor, I have to kind of give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, the views that I'm going to express, to the ex extent I express any views tonight, are, m are my own. Um, I, I, I did work for the government. I no longer speak for the government. Um, and by the same token, um, you know, the, any views I express here are not, not necessarily the views of my current employer, Sotheby's, um, although um, I will be certainly talking about my work at Sotheby's. Um, so um, and anyway, in thinking about what I might be able to add to a panel discussion on heritage issues in the Middle East, it struck me that maybe the most relevant thing that I, as a market, now a market person, uh, could speak about was not necessarily limited in application to the Middle East, but rather the more general subject of how a responsible and law-abiding market participant would behave in the marketplace for cultural heritage objects that we've just heard uh, Marek talk about. Um, you know, and given all the issues and the regula regulatory apparatus there and policy and ethical issues that, that, that are involved. Um, and I, I think that whether, whether or not you think the existing laws are sufficient to protect cultural heritage, um, whether you think the recent repatriation claims that we've all been reading about, or the media coverage of the looting of the Iraq Museum, whether you think any of that has had uh, an impact or has done enough to diminish the looting and pillage of sites. Um, I would, you know, wh wh wherever you fall out of that, I would argue that there is definitely a perceptible and positive shift in the marketplace toward more rigorous provenance standards. Um, and I think that's a good thing, not only from my former perspective as a federal prosecutor, but from my current perspective as the Global Client Compliance Council for Sotheby's, uh, mostly because I see provenance, and when I use that term, I mean ownership history. Um, and I see the provenance as sort of acting as a buffer zone between what should be the legal and legitimate marketplace um, for antiquities on the one hand, and the sort of illegal, dirty business of looting sites on the other. Um, if the marketplace and the people functioning in the market demand and require solid blue chip provenance for archaeological objects, then artifacts that are fresh out of the ground, like from some of the pictures we've just seen, are far less likely or should be far less likely to circulate on the legitimate and legal market. Higher provenance standards, um, also reduce the chances that law-abiding and legitimate institutions or collectors or s vendors will contribute to the cycle of looting and the destruction of sites and the irreparable loss of context and, and historical information that goes along with that. Um, a higher standard. 
you know, imposing a higher standard of care in the due diligence process provides one of the most effective mechanisms for people in the market to distinguish between objects that are legal to sell because they've been out of the ground and out of their countries of origin for a sufficiently long period of time um, so that they're not connected with recent looting and objects that are, on the other hand, the products of recent looting. Now, whether motivated by a belief in the value of cultural heritage preservation or more by self-preservation, buyers and sellers of all types in this marketplace are demanding better and deeper provenance for ancient materials. I think that the lessons that have been learned from the past decade of trials and claims and greater law enforcement um, have made many market participants um, uh, demand, <coughs> excuse me, uh, learn, they've learned lessons. Um, archaeological objects with weak provenance that are, you know, sketchily documented, they carry a risk with them. It carries a risk of being the subject of claims um, in the future. And while many of the legal claims that have been made uh, by countries for the return of archaeological objects or to prosecute people who illegally sell them, um, they're difficult cases to make. They have very long odds of success. They also have a very long shelf life. And it can, well, it can be difficult to prove that case, yet when such evidence is discovered, um, objects uh, that have been possessed for a long time can certainly turn into major liabilities and a source you know, of, of, at worst, criminal liability or reputational damage. Um, and I, you know, I would also argue, and I spend a lot of time arguing and making this point in my current job, that developing and implementing more rigorous standards for provenance um, is actually in order to the long-term benefit and gain of market players. Full provenance commands better market value. Um, you, 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 as we see that clients um, tend to feel more secure when they're buying art pieces that have a, have a better provenance. They are easier to sell later. Um, they purchase without or with a, a, a minimized risk of facing reprisals or claims later on. Um, it makes the object more, um, perhaps more easy to donate to museums if that's what you want to do later on. Um, and I have a couple of examples um, to illustrate this point. In June of 2007, Sotheby's uh, had a record-breaking sale um, of this bronze. It's actually um, not from the Middle East. It's um, uh, really, its country of origin was Italy. It's from uh, Artemis and her stag. Um, it was owned by the Albright Knox Museum, and they had acquired it for their collection in 1953 in New York, and ordinarily, that would be considered by me and most people very good solid provenance. Clearly out of Italy prior to 1970, the date of the UNESCO convention, um, on exhibit in a museum, the long publication history, of uh, no claims, this would ordinarily be, uh, make, you f make me feel very confident. Um, but we had some more information, our due diligence had suggested that Italy had actually granted an export license to allow this piece to leave the country. Um, and we found documents that were created contemporaneously with the 1953 acquisition that backed up this proposition that Italy had granted a license. Um, all of which is very persuasive. Um, given the very high pro profile nature of this particular sale, we did a little more research the specialist in charge of these, uh, the sale of antiquities um, did a little more digging, if you will, and he found, so just some other views of it, he found this. No, no, no. How do you do? Okay, my PowerPoint skills are lacking here. 
there we go. Um, he found this, which um, is a pretty bad copy of a uh, picture of the Artemis, but this is a picture from the Buffalo Courier Express that appeared in 1953 in the newspaper telling the story of the museum's acquisition. And um, you can't read it, but the article actually talks quite a bit about how this piece was taken out of the ground and none of which gave me much comfort. But the caption says, necklace here is export license. And if you can see, there is actually a little wire around the neck of, of, of the statute, which of course was no longer on it when, when it was being sold. Um, and it's, it's a little wire with a, a, a necklace with a seal at the end. And uh, we did a little research into what export licenses looked like if, when they were granted. And this picture is consistent with what we learned. That's actually how they did it. They would sort of attach something to the object. Um, you know, the kind, of, the kind of documentation for provenance and legitimate export that I wish I had for every object we sold. But um, it, 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 in, in any event, this piece did sell for a record price, um, $28.6 million. Um, and it sort of broke the records for, for uh, sculptures at the time. Um, and more to the point that in reporting about this sale, uh, the, the major art reporter for Bloomberg Press wrote, um, deal, quote, dealers said that pristine ownership history made the Albright Knox works even more desirable, especially at a time when the antiquities field has been mired in legal battles over artworks with murky histories. So you, you see, we were, we were seeing sort of commentary about the value of the provenance and the media connecting the provenance with the price. Um, another piece, um, this one is from the Middle East, which sort of il illustrates that point is the, the, uh, this um, lion piece, which is uh, depicted here, and it's a sculpture made of limestone from a period thousands of years even earlier than the Artemis. Um, it was said to have been found near a site in Baghdad, um, acquired by the Martin family in 1948, again, very good provenance. It had been, in fact, on display at the Brooklyn Museum, I think pretty much consistently since that time. Um, hard to beat that kind of solid provenance. But again, the specialists involved in the sale did some additional research. Um, and in, in fact, in checking some archives in, in New York City, where um, there were records of, of old time New York dealers, he found an invoice that um, showed that the prominent New York dealer, Joseph Brummer, had acquired this in 1931 in New York, which made the provenance even better, and for me, had an even greater significance because it, it dated the re uh, removal of this from Iraq prior to the date of Iraq's ownership law that uh, Professor Gerstenblith, the type of law Professor Gerstenblith mentioned. So um, again, sold for record price, $58 million um, or thereabouts. And again, there were a number of press reports that connected the impeccable provenance with the high, with the high price, which is sort of the point I'm trying to make. Um, and um, anyway, the, it's another picture of this, this remarkable piece. Um, but it, that's the point that I'm trying to make with, with these two objects, that there, I think there's an increasing recognition that the long-term sustainability of the market for archaeological objects depends on how successful market players, the buyers and the sellers, can transform the business from one that has historically treated provenance as something of an irrelevant afterthought, or, or even worse, a secret. Um, to one where the provenance actually plays an important role in determining the legitimacy and the value of the object. Um, it's worth mentioning, I, I think, that uh, following this trend, um, and perhaps for many other reasons, last summer, two of the major museum organizations, the uh, Associ Association of American Museum Directors, the AMD, and the AAM, American Association of Museums, both adopted standards and guidelines for their member museums requiring that the member museums obtain documentation 
before, before acquiring an, an ancient object or accepting it on uh, donation or loan, that they require documentation that the object was out of its probable country of origin, um, a, a, a country of modern discovery, prior to November 1970, the date of the UNESCO Convention. The guidelines call for more rigorous provenance research and um, require museums to ask questions of owners and to get as much documentation as they can. Um, both of the, the, of the new guidelines do recognize that there will be situations where, despite good faith research, it may not be possible to document objects back to 1970. Um, and the AMD at least has established a registry on its website where museums might decide if they're in their informed judgment um, that it was probably outside of the country of origin. They could buy it nonetheless and post it on the website um, in, with all the information they have about it. Um, and that you know, remains to be seen whether that mechanism sort of swallows up the whole rule um, and becomes an exception or not. Um, but um, in any event, I think the museum community's adoption of the 1970s standard, whether you think it's, it's gone far enough or too far, it does mark, I think, something of a new era um, in the market. And museums Act, act as uh, market participants when they buy and sell, and um, private buyers and collectors um, also now will, will be somewhat thinking about these standards if they have a view to later on perhaps donating material. It's gonna be relevant because if the provenance isn't there, the museum may, may not accept the donation, um, and I think that has a ripple effect. Um, the, the, the adoption of new standards and the sort of increased recognition of the importance of provenance due diligence uh, brings some additional tough questions for market players. Um, and one of them uh, that I think is gonna be one of the central questions that we need to grapple with in, in the future is what is it that constitutes satisfactory documentation? Or what type of evidence uh, can we consider when we're determining how long, you know, the ownership history uh, of a piece? Um, I think that we may be getting closer to agreeing on, on a date or around the, the date, but I don't think we yet have a good, good enough sense of agreement on how do you determine and what constitutes good enough documentation as to whether or not you're at that date or not. And, um, you know, there's currently and probably going to be continued controversy over, you know, what constitutes the documentation. Reliable, credible, written invoices um, showing, you know, a perfect chronology of the transfer of an, of an object the kind of information that, that I've sort of described that I, we had for these two pieces, sort of the obvious um, publication in books, uh, catalogs that are dated, th those are sort of the, the obvious um, preferred forms of documentation, but fortunately, um, holding, holding the market to that standard of documentation um, doesn't really deal with the historical reality that many buyers and sellers in this market, or probably most, have not created documentary evidence of transfers. Um, until relatively recently, the antiquities market was largely unconcerned, for better or worse, with creating a paper trail. And while we see that practice changing and hope to see it continuing to change, there's still a lot of uncertainty um, surrounding how to deal fairly and appropriately with, with this fact that um, an object could, could have been out, out of its country of origin. It may be legit, uh, legitimately in the market, um, but there may not be a good piece of paper or an article showing its export license in, in a newspaper. 
And I think the challenge that we face is to set the standard at an appropriately calibrated level so that on the one hand, legitimate objects can, can reach the market. Um, and when I say legitimate, you know, m what I think of is if we have proof that in all likelihood it's been out of the ground and out of its country of modern discovery for a sufficiently long time so that it is not associated with recent looting. Um, you know, on the other hand, um, <coughs> if, um, rather, if the, if the, if, if the policies and, and the, the new movement towards uh, more rigorous provenance checking is to have any meaning, um, we have to, we have to kind of give, have the market give up the legacy of accepting vague and unsubstantiated provenance uh, such as it comes from an old Swiss collection or from a reputable dealer. Um, so, you know, you have the two extremes, uh, old Swiss collection photographed in a newspaper with an export license. Where do we fall in the middle? And staking out these new standards, I don't think is going to be that easy. Um, there are a lot of obstacles to documenting ownership history. Uh, there's a lingering hostility in the market to transparency. It, um, it is uh, been written about by, by many, and, um, uh, and I think it's, a, it's an attitude that still pervades the market. Even, even, though the, even among market collectors, buyers and sellers who are not averse to transparency, however, there's still, um, in many cases, just the reality that many of these objects were legitimately bought and sold without documentation being created because it just wasn't that important. And um, you can try to go back to find the documentation and find that the people uh, are gone, they're, they're hard to find. Um, uh, you know, the transfers that happened decades ago are just not documented. There's also a, another reality that in many cases, dealers and sellers invoke confidenti confidentiality in response to those kinds of questions. And it's not always, I mean, sometimes it is, it's not always to obstruct the effort to find out the history, but there are real legal duties, uh, fiduciary duties, that many in the art market hold to keep information confidential. And we at Sotheby's, could, we could not reveal information about our clients. We have a fiduciary duty to them. We have to get permission. So, in, and many times you're, you know, you have ethical and legal duties to maintain confidentiality that conflict with, you know, the need and the desire to create a more transparent market. Um, and sometimes, you know, people in the chain of custody are just difficult to find. They die, they go out of business. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, there are the real serious obstacles. Um, another obstacle is uh, often that, particularly in the auction world, many of the, 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 the people or, or businesses in the chain of custody are competitors. And, it, you know, it's a business and it's difficult to go back and get the cooperation of someone to help you sell the piece. So, you know, you have these commercial realities that, that are sort of coming into play. Um, but, um, you know, in any event, as we grapple with these tough questions going forward about how we can document provenance in this environment where it's traditionally been shunned and there are all these obstacles, one of the things that I have found helpful is to kind of return uh, to my roots as a trial lawyer. Um, you know, I think about, you know, when I, you know, when I have to prove a fact, uh, I may be a little rusty on the finer points, but I, I always think of the federal rules of evidence. Um, you know, how do you prove something? Um, you know, what, what's going to constitute reliable, probative, admissible evidence of a fact? You know, it's not, it's not always through pristine documentation. There are many other ways, even in a court of law, you would prove something. Um, you know, I find myself trying to explain to people that credible and reliable evidence can take many different forms. Um, you know, for one thing, um, uh, well, 
as I said, there, there are certainly it's important to start with asking for and seeking the obvious, um, the obvious types of proof. And there's, you know, there, there, that's where the, 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 you would start with doing a good faith due diligence search for documents, the obvious things, invoices, photographs, publication history. Um, that, that's obviously where you start. But when you, um, uh, when you think out of the box, um, you know, you, you, you may also come up with other types of evidence. Uh, for example, there are many situations where people don't have documents, but they, are, they, will, they will tell you, you know, I don't have any pieces of paper, but you know, I purchased, I, my grandfather purchased this, um, you know, in 1910, and it's been in my family ever since. You could, if you accept that statement blindly, um, you know, you might be subject to some criticism, but there are other things you can do. You can, you can ask that person, you know, are there any photographs from the family that might verify that? Are there any other types of records or papers that you might have that would refer to it? Um, I, I, one of my favorite stories is um, I was talking to someone, a specialist who came to me sort of saying that there, there were some objects that he had actually been involved in a sale of them back in the early 1970s um, to, this, to a gentleman who had passed away. And the son was actually looking out to sell them. And, but he was concerned because he didn't really have any paper to document the provenance. And he was sort of concerned that we probably weren't going to be able to sell them. So he comes to my office, and we're talking about this. And I'm asking, well, you know, could you ask about this or that? And in the middle, he says, well, you know, actually, would you like to see some photos of these pieces? And I said, sure. And he takes out um, photographs that were black and white and, you know, clearly acid covered. And they were ve clearly very old photographs. And they had been taken. Um, a long time ago, and I, I said, well, where did you get these? And apparently these photographs were taken by the father um, of the in, uh, as inventory photographs. And I said, well, this is, doc this is good documentation to show that, to back, to, to back up and corroborate the information we're getting about the pieces. Um, so it's just sort of one example of, of how you, you can you know, in, in striking the balance between, do, you know, documenting provenance, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a verbal account from an interested party without corroboration um, may not cut the mustard, but a verbal account that is corroborated independently by photographs or perhaps by statements um, from uninterested parties. Um, other people who have no interest in the sale saying, Yes, I actually saw that piece in 1950 in France. Um, uh, you know, you have to assess the credibility of what people are telling you and the other documents and come to a judgment. Um, and uh, I guess in conclusion, um, I would just sort of stress that while I think we see uh, the market moving to an agree closer to an agreement um, on the value of provenance um, and the importance of it, I think that we also need to work on developing a consensus for what is the generally accepted quality of documentation. Um, and that's, you know, an, an, you know we, we need to make sure that we, we demand provenance that has good indicia of reliability and credibility um, in order to make the whole enterprise w meaningful um, and, um, and to affect change in the market and to reduce the looting. So, okay, thanks.